Almarai's dairy production exceeds 1 billion liters per year, which are produced by a herd of over 170,000 cows, the largest in the region. In recent years, and to achieve vertical integration, Almarai invested more than 5 billion rials in the industrial sector to meet the market demand, where its products reach more than 18 million consumers in the Gulf Corporation Council, GCC, every day. The company also invested in the agricultural sector by creating seven super farms in the kingdom, in addition to the various agricultural investments abroad, such as Argentina, where Almarai raised its farm's area to more than 32,000 hectares. It also launched partnerships with local companies like Allied Farmers Company, which invests in farms in Ukraine and the United States of America, from who Almarai imports more than 600,000 tons of feed annually. Those 600,000 tons of U.S. feed, most of it comes from Arizona. And to understand how Arizona hay and alfalfa end up going to Saudi cows is to first understand that the world and all its people and problems are connected, all linked. And that includes climate change. Climate change isn't simply a question of better policies or cleaner technology. It's about how all the connections, political and economic, individual and societal, local and global, past, present, future, are part of the equation. And that makes the equation exponentially more difficult to change and more complicated to understand. But understand we must, because if we don't, well, that story doesn't have a happy ending for any of us. We need to go back more than 100 years to around the start of the 20th century, when some ambitious and far-sighted American politicians, led by the most ambitious and far-sighted of them all, President Teddy Roosevelt, decided to fill in some of the blank spaces that existed across our vast continent. The Southwest was one of those places, and the goal was to encourage farmers and ranchers to settle here. That meant the government stepping in and ensuring the one thing every farmer, every rancher, every person needs, water. Without a guaranteed year-round supply, there would not be, there could not be, an American West. Roosevelt Dam was the answer for Arizona, 76 miles northeast of Phoenix, built in a narrow gorge between the Salt River and Tonto Creek. Uh, in the end, the, this, was a, this was a game, a race, to create an incentive to get hardworking, ambitious settlers to move into the middle of the desert. How do you get a bunch of smart, hardworking people to run as fast as they can into the desert? You tell them, if you get there first, you get the water. And by the way, we'll build the infrastructure to help get the water to you. So uh, in order for us to build a country uh, and fill a continent, all kinds of policies were put into place uh, to create water resources. And there's all kinds of reasons you would want to do that. Um, you want to grow cities and farms, uh, let people move here, uh, move to the West. Um, you want to provide economic productivity and industry, uh, tax revenue, um, and I think that uh, from the perspective of building a country uh, or building a civilization, the policies and visions of, uh, of our leaders from 100 years ago have really played out the way they imagined. When it was built, the Roosevelt Dam was the largest masonry dam in the world and Roosevelt Lake the largest artificial reservoir. This massive undertaking helped turn Arizona from desert to fertile farmable land it made Phoenix and Arizona possible. When the project was authorized in 1903, just 5,500 souls lived in the Phoenix area. Even so, Roosevelt and politicians from both parties joined together to achieve something great that, and this is key, didn't provide any political benefit to any of them. No votes, no donations. They did it for the future of the country. They proved that Arizona could support real economic growth and paved the way for Arizona to become the 48th state in 1912. All was great for decades, until Arizona needed more water than the state's rivers and aquifers could provide. 
And so the Central Arizona Project, or CAP, was conceived. Those Arizona rivers were perfectly adequate for 100 years of development, but by the mid 20th century, those rivers were tapped out and we had started pumping groundwater and we could see the groundwater table already beginning to decline by the 1940s and 1950s. And so at that point, um, movers and shakers, uh, politicians as well as business interests uh, in the state started looking around for the next batch of water that we could you know, control, capture, divert and bring to this valley to keep growth going here in the valley. And the Colorado River was one of the biggest, but it was just so far away and the cost and engineering feat necessary to bring Colorado River from the California border all the way here to central Arizona was so far beyond anything the state could ever imagine doing on its own that it required, um, you know, it required the federal government, it required national taxpayers to fund that project. The most expensive engineering project in history, CAP had to be a national project and virtually every Arizona Democrat and Republican in the Senate and the House of Representatives worked as one year after year to make it happen. Even with all that firepower, it was not an easy sale. From conception to completion, it took decades. The legislation was first introduced in 1946 and not passed until 1968, with construction beginning in 1973 and finishing 20 years later in 1993. But they did it together. That's how good government works. That's how democracy works. That's how you build a future. That's how you bring water to the desert. Today, the artificial river runs 336 miles through some harsh territory. 336 miles. The Suez Canal is only 120 miles long. The Panama Canal, a mere 50 miles. But it's more than just length. Rivers are supposed to run downhill, but CAP pushes all that water uphill to where we want it to go. 1979, a huge tunnel boring machine, a mole, chewed its way through the final inches of the western flank of the Buckskin Mountains in Arizona. Hole through, they call it. This admirable example hasn't been followed by everyone, not at all. From time immemorial, desert dwellers lived in harmony with the natural world, taking only what was necessary to sustain the life of family and community, wise stewards of the land. Then they struck oil, got rich, and discovered they could have more. Welcome to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Most of the country looks like Arizona, from sand to rock to some water underground and not much falling from the sky. For centuries, the people of this desert were nomadic or lived in small communities. They survived by adapting to the terrain and its resources. They relied on animals such as camels suited to the desert's deprivations. They preserved their water, 98% of which came from aquifers by respecting its limitations and used it with the greatest care. That all changed when the kingdom became oil rich in the 1970s. With money came ambition and ambition begat arrogance. Saudi no longer wanted to be dependent on other countries for food and started to build agriculture on a massive scale, planting fields, importing cattle. So massive, in fact, it became a major exporter of dairy products, wheat and other goods. That required not only a lot of money, but also a lot of water. The uh, country doesn't have, never had uh, uh, the culture of farming or uh, uh, agriculture uh, because there was no water. For millennia, uh, there was uh, no, there were no pumps to, uh, to uh, until the Industrial Revolution. There were no pumps to extract that water from, uh, uh, from aquifers. And, uh, and uh, until the uh, late 70s, mid late 70s, uh, Saudi Arabia didn't have the, uh, the, the money to buy the, uh, the uh, 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 to create the infrastructure for, for farming. 
If there is one person to talk to about Saudi Arabia and money and water, it would be Eli El Hajj, former CEO of the Arab National Bank in Saudi Arabia, now living in London and an author and doctor of environmental and political studies. Uh, 12 years, a dozen years, between 1980 and 1992, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the irrigated uh, surface uh, increased from somewhere around the uh, 60,000 hectares to close to uh, a million hectares. And uh, uh, wheat production increased during this uh, period uh, from around 150,000 tons a year to four over 4 million, 4.1 million uh, uh, tons uh, uh, per year. A huge increase. Uh, so much so that Saudi Arabia became the sixth largest uh, wheat exporter in the world. From nothing to becoming the sixth largest exporter of wheat in the, in, in the world. By the early 90s, oil revenues were dropping and so was the water table. In 20 years, Saudi had used 300 billion cubic meters of water, water that would not be replenished, water gone forever. A, a staggering, a staggering uh, uh, volume of water to waste on a, uh, on a, this is the endowment of the future generation being wasted on, on, on uh, uh, foodstuffs that could have been bought at a fraction of the cost of, of growing it at home. In 2015, after more than three decades of trying to achieve self-sufficiency, the kingdom ended its wheat production program. There was no political, uh, regional political uh, issues involved. It was more to enrich the, the, the ruling elite and to rally around the uh, rulers, uh, uh, the ruling family, uh, this uh, uh, fantastic slogan uh, of food independence and, 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 and that sort of thing, uh, as if deserts could ever be food independent. By then, of course, Saudi had grown these enormous agriculture corporations owned by some of the most powerful people in the country. They weren't ready to simply close the doors and walk away. Al Marai is the largest of those companies. Its presence in the kingdom is ubiquitous. Its trucks crisscrossing the country, its products on store shelves everywhere. It has become, in Saudi and through much of the region, an essential company. So Al Marai did what any giant transnational corporation, meaning a corporation that does business in different countries and is not only rich, but often richer than many nations, would do. It went looking for what it needed elsewhere. This is the town of Vicksburg in western Arizona, just north of the I-10, not too far from the border with California. Vicksburg has 621 residents, a lot of them retirees, and the median house value is $30,000, the median income $48,000. Vicksburg has a couple of neighbors, Salmon and Wendon, and not much else. And that's the way it's been for a long time, until 2014, when Al Marai, through its American subsidiary, bought almost 10,000 acres around Vicksburg for $47.5 million. The Saudis, their own wheat program finished, needed the land to produce alfalfa to feed its cattle back home. Three facts about alfalfa. It requires an enormous amount of water, it can grow all year, and it grows very fast, again and again. And I think that's where a lot of the animosity comes from because you've lost that small town farmer that helps take care of the community to corporate farming where, you know, there's nothing being brought to the table here. Al Marai was clear as to its objectives, as reported in the Arab News. This transaction forms part of Al Marai's continuous effort to supply the highest quality alfalfa from outside the kingdom to support its dairy business. It is also in line with the Saudi government direction towards conserving local resources. People around here weren't happy, and then people's wells started coming up dry. In fact, since the 1950s, the water table in the area has dropped 120 feet. 
homeowners began digging thousands of feet down in the hope, sometimes desperate hope, of striking water. I'm just curious what they're going to kick the farmers out of the I'm hearing that there's uh, people from out of country that bought our property or on your bought property around here growing the alfalfa, which takes more water than anything, especially in hot climate like this. They've already pumped their area in, in Saudi Arabia or wherever they're from. Uh, and now they're over here doing the same to our country. The legal framework of who owns and controls the water in the West is a complex mix of rights claimed by individuals, states, and the federal government. The prior appropriation doctrine is a water rights system that's more common in the West. And that's first in time, first in use. So if you start using water first, and if you keep using it for something that's a beneficial use, then you get to keep using it until uh, you agree to stop using it. And people would agree to stop using it uh, usually when someone else gives them a lot of money for their land or uh, or for some kind of water transfer agreement. The power of this old thought is still very apparent in the rural counties of Arizona, outside what we call active management areas, where there's no effective limitation on how much water can be pumped. The only legal limitation is you must not waste it. If you put it to a beneficial use, you may pump. If you can find it, you have to get a licensed well driller to drill the hole in the ground but once you have a well, you may pump essentially without limitation on the quantity. Within the last few years in Wilcox, Arizona, the residents began to panic because many of the wells started going dry. And the Department of Water Resources organized lots of public meetings and private meetings to try to see if a consensus could be formed to bring a new system of groundwater management into that part of the state. And basically, because the local residents could not agree among themselves, it went nowhere. Now, they were on the verge of an emergency, and some of the people now do have to haul water. But even in the face of pending doom, so to speak, they could not reach agreement with their neighbors. The people who still had water in the pipes did not want to have their pumping rights curtailed. That meant that Al Marai got to upgrade or install well after well to maintain these lush fields. And while the company brags about its tech's water conserving efficiency, each of its wells is capable of pumping a billion and a half gallons of water out of the ground. Remember, the large scale farming engaged in by the Saudis and other transnationals in Arizona is not about producing food for people, but for cattle. And that's part of the broader problem, not only that we use so much water, but how we use it. So when you look at with the world changing and its fertile lands are changing, that we actually need to protect and use our agriculture here, but in the smartest most possible way, growing a diversity of food that is not as water intensive, that doesn't put so many, you know, um, food miles going completely somewhere else. What about food for Arizona, for the Southwest and places like that? Arizona is far from the only place Al Marai has a massive operation. It also has 15,000 acres in Blythe, California, just over the Arizona border and along the Colorado River. Nor is it the only Middle Eastern company in the Southwest. Al Dara, ACX, from the United Arab Emirates, has a 16,000 acre farm in Kingman, Arizona, another 5,000 acres elsewhere in the state, and 10,000 acres spread between California's Palo Verde and Imperial Valleys. Both grow alfalfa, and both also buy additional tons of hay from U.S. farmers, all to ship home. We understand that uh, if the deeper you withdraw the water, the less water you have, the less quality you have, and the less the, the more the water costs, the less you make. So uh, you just you just. Uh, ruining the profit in farming by, you know, that's, that's one of the resources you have to have is cheap, good water. So look where we are. The Saudi state destroyed its most precious resource, not oil, but water, because it had pretensions of becoming a world agricultural power, because it had money and wanted to eat massive amounts of beef like Westerners, because it wanted to enrich its elite. 
and so came to America to do the same. But the sad truth is U.S. corporations, U.S. transnationals, own considerably more farmland in Arizona, including in this same county and in California, in order to accomplish much the same thing, use the water in as much as possible to produce alfalfa and hay for export. Riverview, a Minnesota dairy, has 37,000 acres near Wilcox to grow corn, wheat, and alfalfa to feed some 150,000 cattle on the property. Then there's Integrated Ag, with close to 10,000 acres not far from Mark's farm. Integrated Ag isn't your family farm, but first and foremost, an investment group. As the company proclaims on its website, who we are, Integrated Ag provides sophisticated investors a portfolio of farmland investments designed to create immediate capital appreciation through its value-add investment process. It isn't that Integrated Ag is necessarily malevolent, though that name does have a certain corporate overlord evil ring to it. It's that Integrated Ag doesn't have the connection to the land or people who live on it and care about it and maybe want to pass it down to their kids. The investment works or it doesn't, and when it fails, as has happened with all kinds of crops, then the company pulls up stakes, leaving dried out wells behind. Our, we had six wells and they all turned salty and, and uh, we had to quit using them and we had to drill a, a new well for about half a million dollars and it's 1,300 feet and it'll only last for a while. If it weren't the Saudis, it would be somebody else. I mean, if you look at what's happened in the Imperial Valley of California, I mean, that whole valley has been shipping almost all of its alfalfa to Japan for years and years and years. Farmers are looking for export markets, and they will make the argument that it's good for the economy to be, you know, net revenue positive in terms of the balance of trade uh, that our country enjoys. And the farmers in Arizona are making the same argument, whether the farms are owned by Saudis or not. Uh, the problem is that there's huge amounts of water being mined uh, basically for free uh, with not enough benefit going to the local people and most of the benefit going to people who live far away. Uh, so it's, it doesn't, the perception is that it's not a fair trade. And Arizona and other people in situations like Arizona uh, will be dealing with the effects uh, hundreds of years from now of having depleted that water. And meanwhile, a global corporation can pick up and move on to uh, the next place that has water. But that's the nature of the global economy, where transnational corporations are global colonizers without allegiance to any country going wherever is best to open farms or factories, source materials and workers, and sell their goods. Their wealth and power mean that transnationals are not merely rich and powerful companies. They are vital links in the global supply chain and thus critical to national security and world economies, thus becoming government partners, sometimes cooperative and sometimes adversarial. The Saudi and UAE transnationals in Arizona also own farmland in South America, Africa, and throughout the world to keep the feed coming, as well as provide other agricultural products taking the water out of the ground with virtually no oversight. The issue of cooperating with very large corporations is another question where I think um, there we have a much less good track record of, of being able to uh, find mechanisms for organizing global cooperation, um, not simply as a club of nation states, but in a way that includes large corporations, or is at least very attentive to how it counterbalances them and how it fits. Um, and I think you know, the world uh, doesn't know very well how to think about the governance side of large corporations. So it's one big world where government and corporate policies and profits sometimes overlap and sometimes don't. And this is the fundamental problem with dealing with climate change, because it's way down on the list of big power priorities. So even though Almiraz holdings in the United States cause some complaints and, in the long run, are really not beneficial to either Saudis or Americans, the kingdom has, for decades, in administration after administration, been largely shielded from criticism, despite often working in opposition to American goals and beliefs. 
even in the wake of 9-11, when 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi citizens, even when, 18 years later, Saudi actions crossed a grotesque and very public line in the murder of journalist and U.S. resident Jamal Khashoggi. We also have a great ally in Saudi Arabia. They give us a lot of jobs, they give us a lot of business, a lot of economic development. Trump's simplistic preference for profits over all else was for once in line with past administrations, for the answer has always been money and oil. Oil they had and we needed to keep the economy running and our military moving, and president after president danced, sometimes literally, to the Saudi beat. Though the U.S. has achieved energy independence, courtesy of fracking, the environmentally destructive process of injecting liquid underground in order to force open fissures in the rocks and extract oil or gas, and we don't need the Saudis like we used to, nothing has changed. In the end, the economic dynamic will remain the same, which states, the drive and demands of capitalism will not be denied. Most of the biggest agribusiness companies in the world are, are American. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so they're right. They're right in the middle of this, you know, for every for every example that we can find of a Saudi company doing something here, there's probably a hundred uh, of U.S. companies operating uh, in in interesting ways in other parts of the world. Yeah. It is a global system. It ought to be good for Arizona to bring in revenues from the sale of commodity, no matter where it goes. Um, but also, water experts from all over the West, certainly, um, have predicted for probably two decades that places with water throughout the world are going to become virtual water for places in the world where groundwater is being pumped dry, you know, throughout the Middle East and parts of India and parts of China and so forth. When the water is gone, it is gone, and those people have no choice but to import commodity, uh, food, fiber, livestock feed, whatever it is they want, they have no choice but to import it from somewhere else in the world. So that all this commodity now is being talked about as if it's virtual water. But we're talking about trade. We're talking about sales of product. And the U.S. wants to do that. So we can blame Saudi Arabia for a lot of things, and the list is long, but not for acting within the parameters of the global economy. That economy has invented the idea of virtual water, water that is part and parcel of everything we buy and consume. The issue about the Saudi dairies is, is such a fascinating issue because it exposes so much of our complicated relationship with water, which is that there's this idea of virtual water virtual water or embedded water, which is that there's water inside of everything. There's water inside of your lettuce, there's water inside of your clothes, there's water inside of the electricity coming out of your uh, out of your outlets, right? Water is used to make literally everything. So water is embedded inside of everything. And if we had filled up giant tankers full of water and shipped them off to Saudi Arabia, people would have lost their minds. But if you take that same quantity of water and you embed it inside of lettuce or alfalfa and you ship that away, people see that as free markets. We see it as free trade. That's business as usual, but that becomes more than a problem. It becomes unsustainable and ruinous to humanity and the environment when you factor in that water is the one irreplaceable commodity on the planet and already under stress from farming and pollution and rising populations and climate change and that one in nine people around the world already don't have access to safe drinking water, and one in three don't have access to basic sanitation. What can we do about it? Or are the overarching forces that shape our world and impact our lives simply unstoppable? Remember all those protests in Vicksburg about the Saudis and the water disappearing? The protests died out, though nothing happened, nothing changed, except that the water keeps disappearing. My home, I've always believed I was going to have it forever till the day I die. It's my, it's my home to last forever, but then, and I can grow food and enjoy um, my home. But now I feel like, gosh, is it really going to be my full blown retirement home? And when I'm a senior, am I going to have water to, to continue this dream of mine to almost be self-sustaining? 
We can excuse them for feeling helpless because Vicksburg homeowners have no influence with transnational corporations or global forces. And it's only going to get worse because climate change is going to get worse and the Colorado River is going to continue to run drier and the groundwater is going to continue to be sucked up. We are in the midst of not just a drought, but a mega drought driven by climate change and one that could last decades. The headlines tell a frightening story. Mega drought emerging in the Western US could be the worst in 1200 years. US drought could last a century as we now enter a mega drought. One issue in dealing with water or any aspect of climate change is that the problems are local, such as failing wells at a small Arizona town, but the issues are national and global, meaning actions that will have an impact on those wells must have a multi-tier political and economic approach. So the snows in the Rocky Mountains, which feed the Colorado River, can fall again. So there'll be so much water in Arizona, the aquifers can be replenished. Everything is connected, linked in relentless motion. The science tells us over and over that we have just a few years to act to prevent the truly disastrous effects of climate change. Maybe we have 10 years, maybe 20 or 30, but any way you cut it, we have to act. And if we don't, a global cataclysm will tumble upon us with full force. Then there are many who say our only hope is to act in dramatic and drastic fashion now, all other issues and considerations pushed aside. We're out there talking about banning all new fossil fuel infrastructure, right? No new pipelines, no new drilling, no new export terminals, totally banning fracking. I mean, like uh, changing the miles per gallon standard to zero immediately, all electric for new cars. I'm in rebellion against the British government for its crimes against humanity, for its refusal over the last 30 years to take emergency action to reduce carbon emissions, for facilitating the genocide of the next generation. The issues that we're facing are three main scenarios. One is the collapse of civilizations, or you've got billions of people dying, or human extinction. Billions of people are going to die. I can't believe I'm saying this. You know, look, I look around me at all this electricity. I came in an electric car. I went through London. And yet we are facing a catastrophe and we need to act. We like strong regulation, right? Ban single use plastic, ban uh, factory farms, ban the expansion of the fossil fuel economy and then start through massive, massive investment because this was part of the World War II response also, right? We spent like 40% of our GDP on the war, our whole GDP. So massive investment. I mean, we, we believe that the government should spend without limit to save as much life as possible. The mother of all crises means that it's quite possible that all life on Earth, 97% of it, is going to go and possibly in my children's lifetime. Conventional politics is, is fucked. It's finished. This civilization's finished. It's finished, you know, whether you like it or not. We failed. I failed. You failed. Those of you that run those big businesses, you have failed big time. It's nothing to do with values. You've got values coming out of your ears, right? Values, 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 but no courage. I don't think people have the inherent right to buy SUVs just because they want one. I don't think people have the right to go on cruise ships that pollute as much as a million cars a day because they want to take a vacation. And to some people, maybe those are important rights, but I think that certain rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, freedom to decide who to marry and love are very important. Um, rights about uh, being able to buy whatever you want, whenever you want, for the cheapest price possible, you know, I. I'm willing to infringe on those. Most likely is uh, civilization will collapse or continue collapsing. Um, you know, like, we, yeah, we already saw state failure in Syria. We'll see continued state, state failure in the Middle East and Africa, especially uh, state failure in South America. Um, you know, Bangladesh, obviously intensely under pressure. And we'll see huge amount of refugees. We'll see, um, racist and xenophobic and violent reactions from the global north. Um, 
I mean, it'll be, we'll see more pandemics and vector-borne disease, especially, I mean, ticks, um, mice, uh, mosquitoes are gonna go up, up, up. This is very bad. I, I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, the apocalypse. I mean, it's, it's truly biblical and horrible and hard to describe and certainly hard to overstate. If one contends, and not unreasonably so, that this situation is due or literally die, it is also not entirely unreasonable to think we must reorder society, imposing harsh dictates on every citizen. But where is the evidence that is conceivable? The problem with the World War II example of the U.S. government anticipating and shifting the entire society, often favored by advocates of imposing emergency decrees, is that it doesn't prove the case. America, along with the entire West, didn't react quickly. In fact, we didn't do anything as the Nazis consolidated power, as they built their concentration camps, as they marched across Europe. We didn't do much of anything, not until the bombs fell on Pearl Harbor and we had no choice. Another issue, and one that many will see as both obvious and jarring, is that some in the movement are interested in using climate change as a lever to fundamentally change society. This is true of the impetus underlying Extinction Rebellion, as explained in an article in Medium by Stuart Basden, another one of Extinction Rebellion's founders, in January 2019, entitled, Extinction Rebellion Isn't About the Climate. Basden wrote that the climate's breakdown is a symptom of a toxic system, and as Europeans spread their toxicity around the world, they brought torture, genocide, carnage, and suffering to the ends of the earth. Furthermore, Euro-Americans violently imposed and taught dangerous delusions that they used to justify the exploitation and reinforced our dominance, while silencing worldviews that differed or challenged them. Bastin calls on his Extinction Rebellion compatriots to never say we're a climate movement, because we're not. We're a rebellion, and we're rebelling to highlight and heal from the insanity that is leading to our extinction. Bastin and others wish to throw out Western civilization in total, evidently finding no redeeming features, virtues, or accomplishments to keep. While few today would defend the ills of the West, from politics to capitalism, that is far from seeking to destroy it and replace it with what exactly? A quasi-fascist green state? An authoritarian agrarian paradise? That's one view. Then there's the other extreme, as demonstrated by a random assortment of stupid things Arizona politicians and members of the U.S. House of Representatives have said. I do not believe climate change is occurring. I do not think that humans have a significant impact on climate. The federal government should stop regulating and stomping on our economy and freedoms in the name of a discredited theory. Is some of it maybe human caused? Possibly, but certainly not the majority of it. I think it just goes through cycles and it has a lot to do with the sun. I don't see the data. When you think about the complexity of a worldwide system and the amount of data you'd have to capture, how do you adjust for a sunspot? Yes, they're all Republicans, the only major political party on the planet that denies the reality of climate change. So Obama's talking about all of this with the global warming and that, and a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? And you can decide for yourself whether they're just that stupid or also cynical cowards lying to appeal to their constituencies. Nonetheless, there are more politicians who believe in climate change than don't, and believe is the wrong word because you either accept science or you decide not to because it's inconvenient or unpleasant. We don't have time to wait. This is an urgent task. And laws have been passed and EPA regulations issued. However, even putting aside the damage done by the Trump administration, those measures have not been remotely sufficient. This isn't because there aren't enough great ideas, technologies, and plans ready to go. Just look at the internet. They're everywhere. 100 solutions to reversing global warming. 80 already exist today, and when taken together, those 80 can achieve drawdown. These are solutions that are viable, scalable, and financially feasible. This is a list of the top 20 solutions to reversing global warming. There are no silver bullets or a subset of solutions that are going to get us there. So there is, you know, a sense in which we're getting slowly, very slowly, to the point where we are able to figure out the business case. And frankly, that's how we're gonna solve this, right? We're not gonna solve this through charity.
The most promising solution of all may be to look lower on the food chain. Instead of cramming large carnivorous fish into pens, we can work with natural ocean systems to produce huge amounts of shellfish and seaweeds. These low-maintenance flora and fauna don't need to be fed at all. In fact, they naturally improve water quality, filtering it as they feed off of sunlight and nutrients in the seawater. So this is like the best bargain in human history. Uh, if you think like an entrepreneur, like your, your uh, audience does, you know, this may be the single business, you know, biggest uh, business opportunity in human history. We are holding the power of decision. We have the capital, we have the technology, we have the, the, the wherewithal, we have to do this. The question is not what politicians believe, but whether government can really be an effective force for solving climate change. Consider this. The COVID-19 pandemic is still with us while we film. We know that to stop it, we need to stop it everywhere, the way we eventually did with smallpox. And yet, how have we reacted? How well did China work with the U.S. and other nations? Next, a new report from U.S. intelligence finding that China misled the world about how bad the coronavirus outbreak was while also stockpiling face masks and other medical supplies. How well did the U.S. work with the states? Yeah, no, I don't take responsibility at all. The Washington Post is reporting the president's decision to pass the responsibility onto the governors is largely designed to shield him from blame. How well did the states work with their counties and cities? Governor Inslee, in his infinite wisdom, has decided after over 100 and some odd days that we should all wear face masks inside and out. Here's, here's what I say. Don't be a sheep. And in all those countries and states and counties and cities, how well is everyone following the guidelines and rules on wearing masks and social distancing? This morning, the party is over after criticism from across the country about younger people ignoring orders of social distancing. How well do we work together? And one more thing, if you wonder if people will really care about saving lives in the face of climate change, Look how many didn't care during this pandemic when the choice was saving lives or protecting the economy. So it's not simply a matter of political enlightenment and goodwill. It's whether government and industry, politics and capitalism are structurally and philosophically capable of properly and quickly responding. Basic point in Hobbes, right? Without government, life is nasty, brutish and short. So it's what brings groups together to delegate power over us, which is when you think about it, we take it for granted, but it's really paradoxical that individuals want to be in governments. They want to be coerced because they realize if they're not coerced, they're going to be killed. So, and given the choice, coercion is a lot better than being killed. I'm placing a bet in my comments, which is that it's possible for democratic societies to um, learn and reform themselves fast enough to be able to confront these issues within the framework of democracy. As against the bet some would place, um, that Extinction Rebellion or something would place, which is, no, in order to avert climate disaster, we will have to sacrifice democracy and get some sort of enlightened autocracy. I think it catches you hardly ever get enlightenment when you get the autocracy. Who's the story, probably apocryphal, I think it was said of some French aristocrat who had to be because of his politics, who had this estate, uh, marvelous, and, and they were uh, wanting to decorate it and be told to the grass, we must plant all these trees. And they said, well, but they won't really have the room and you'll make the impact for a hundred years. And he said, that's why we must do it today. Since I care about democracy as well as care about the climate, I want the two together. And so my bet is going to be on trying to do whatever work it takes to strengthen democracy and the ability of democratic societies to um, effectively cooperate and pursue the necessary policies. If I were standing outside this and it wasn't about my future and I was just going to bet money in some, you know, 
you know, if I were some god standing out among the gods on Mount Olympus and placing wagers on what those crazy people would do, I would not necessarily bet that everybody will cooperate enough to do this, that everybody will change fast enough to do it, that national politics won't get in the way. Um, it seems to me entirely possible that we will see wars occasioned by climate change before we see the structuring of, of a more effective cooperation. Now, not desirable, but if I were a betting man, not a bad bet. Not a bad bet, because the facts can be overwhelming and they never stop piling up. Here's another, and since we started with water and cows, let's end there. By 2050, it's estimated that China's newly acquired Western taste for milk, just milk, is expected to increase global greenhouse gas emissions 35%. That's just one country, albeit a big one, and one product. When you look at it that way, the Saudi impulse to get in the dairy game wasn't totally unwarranted, though still ridiculous and self-destructive. So here we are, back at the beginning. Everything is connected, overlapping, intersecting. The question is whether those connections allow for the kind of changes we need to effectively fight climate change. The question is whether global political interests, government national security interests, transnational financial interests, small business commercial interests, and individual self-interest can be managed or reconfigured or dispensed with to create sensible policies. The reality is no one element can do it alone. And there won't be a magic bullet, no technological cure-all, no one-stop government fix, no citizen uprising. Rather, we will do what we always do when danger comes quietly, slowly, burrowing in until it rises to overwhelm and destroy. We will respond sporadically, piecemeal, two steps forward, one back, and hopefully fumble and fight our way to solutions that don't arrive too late to save us. Hopefully that will be good enough. We will find out soon. <laughs>